Okay, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome back for yet another session of uh, African history, uh, paper 210 stroke 6. And uh, this is a paper that basically deals with uh, issues of uh, students in A level, uh, senior 5 and senior 6. Uh, last time I told you this is a paper that runs between 1855 to 1914, and anything that is beyond that period is not our business. Uh, last time, uh, last weekend, last Saturday, we handled a pertinent issue or a topic um, known as scrum and partition. And uh, we really discussed a lot and we talked a lot about uh, scrum and partition. And indeed, we felt it better that it would be nice for you to follow uh, the topic in form of question and answer. And indeed, what we did, we were guided by a direct question. And I remember that question stated that account for the colonization of Africa by the 19th century. And indeed, it was deliberate for us to first go through the known so that we could introduce the unknown later. And of course, today, we are going to move away from the direct questions or from the known to more complicated and complex uh, questions about the same topic. I know when we always talk about um, scramble and partition, every student, every learner at all levels, whether O or A, want to answer something about the topic. But now, our area of interest is elevated, as I've already informed you. And of course, for those who attended uh, the discussion of last time, you were in position to at least have a preamble and the background of what Scrum and Partition was all about. We wrapped it under colonization. And I always task my learners and students um, to figure out whether there is a, a, a critical and a pertinent difference between colonization and scramble and partition, or one led to the other. Of course, that would be another story altogether. But of course, today, we are going to be guided by two questions. And of course, these questions are going to be indirect questions or questions that are two-sided. One of the questions is stating, um, to what extent, to what extent, question, to what extent, to what extent did philanthropic to what extent did philanthropic factors lead to the colonization, colonization of Africa? We have a question at hand. To what extent did philanthropic factors lead to the colonization of Africa? Very interesting. I told you last time, our focus was on direct questions. Okay? Introducing us to the topic, scramble and partition. Now we've moved away from direct questions to indirect questions or two-sided questions. Last time I told you, in order to get the gist of the question, to know what the question requires, it is palatable and important for you to get the key words in that question. And those key words will be used as a stimulus or as a stem for you to know the right question approach and interpretation. Now, in this question, the key words are, to what extent, we've underlined. Another one is philanthropic factors. Now the issue of English comes in. Then another one is colonization. Mm -hmm. That is where the question is being derived from. The subject or the topic is colonization. 
Mm -hmm. We are underlining philanthropism because it is the core. So the core of the question is philanthropic factors. Philanthropic. Philanthropic factors. And to what extent is guiding us, okay, giving us the right approach and interpretation of the question. So to what extent simply indicates that the question is two-sided. To what extent is an indication that the question is two-sided. The question is two-sided. Therefore, it means that one of the parts of the question is the philanthropic factors. So on the however side, we have other factors. So it is the philanthropism versus others. Now, just like last time, when I was taking you through how a good essay would look like, don't forget the principles of IBC. Just to remind you, I simply means introduction, B simply means body, and C is conclusion. Irrespective of the nature of the question, whether it is a direct question or one-sided, or a two-sided question, an introduction should not miss, a body should not miss, and the conclusion, body is actually the content, okay? Body is the content, uh-huh. So, because the question is two-sided, because of the what-to-what what extent, what does it insinuate? It also means that the question requires a standpoint. A standpoint. I'll later inform you that a standpoint is supposed to be measurable. A standing point is supposed to be measurable, okay? Indeed, for those who are in senior six, of course, when I'm talking about this, it might not be a big issue to the senior fives because uh, when it comes to coverage, uh, it is quite small. But for senior sixes, you are aware that a favorable standing point is characterized by three features, okay? A standing point... A standing point has the following features. One, it should be it should be consistent. A standing point is supposed to be consistent. Otto. A standing point is supposed to be committal. You commit yourself. And the standing point is supposed to be measurable. It is supposed to be measurable. What do I mean? Whatever stand that you take, as long as you can defend it, it should have the three features. Consistency, you should be in position to commit yourself, and you should be in position to measure what you are actually explaining. What do I mean by this? You can say, I'm just giving uh, a sample, an example. You can say to a larger, you can say to a smaller, you can say to a lesser, you can say to a bigger, you can say, you can say primarily, Hope you are aware that primarily is the same as to a bigger or larger. Primarily, you can say um, significantly, or even greatly. When you look at all these words that I've listed here, they are measurable, okay? Don't use heights to determine a standing point. Therefore, you cannot say to a taller, neither can you say to a shorter. That is not allowed. You cannot also say, you, we, you don't use weights to determine the stand point. Okay? So you cannot say to a fatter, 
Okay? Eh? And so on and so forth. That is not acceptable. Okay? So, the, 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 the most important thing that I'm emphasizing here is a standpoint is supposed to be committal, it is supposed to be consistent, and it's supposed to be measurable. It does not matter where you give it. However, we always encourage learners to ensure that in questions that are two-sided, after giving us your introduction, create a paragraph for a standpoint. I always encourage my learners not to uh, hide the standpoint in the middle of the introduction. Why? Because the person marking your work may not be in position to see that you've actually taken a standpoint, yet that person is supposed to mark the standpoint. So here, after giving us a brief introduction, okay, by the way, your introduction is also supposed to be brief, okay? I always use the word kiss as an abbreviation for a brief introduction. Kiss simply means keep it short but sweet, okay? Keep it short but sweet, okay? So that is an introduction, kiss. Keep it short but sweet. But you can introduce, because now the question is two-sided, you can introduce your work in more than one paragraph. Of course, I expect a brilliant student to give us a preamble and a flashback of colonization, what it was on about, okay? You can go ahead by defining what colonization was all about. Go ahead and give us examples of countries, European powers that participated in the episode, go ahead and tell us that the factors that led to the episode were many and varied. A combination of long and short term. And they can be classified under push or pull factors. And these can be either political or social or philanthropic or humanitarian, which is actually the core of the question here, um, strategic, economical, or otherwise. Why do I bring in the element of otherwise? Because there are some factors that equally contributed to the colonization of Africa, but cannot be classified under the so-called major factors, but they are acceptable and they are relevant if well articulated Dr. and addressed. Now, you create another paragraph by telling us, however, to a dash dash extent, I'm using the word dash dash because I'm not here to determine your standpoint. To a dash dash extent, philanthropic factors led to the colonization of Africa in the following ways. And now, that will take you to the other part of your essay, which is B that I talked about. Don't forget the IBC, introduction, body, and conclusion and now you're going to present your information the body in a purely paragraph form okay in a paragraph form now as i earlier informed you the issue of english comes in here philanthropic is not a new term okay so it is not a new term you should just know that when we are dealing with philanthropism it is as good as saying philanthropic is as good as saying humanitarian factors humanitarian factors or social social factors now for purposes of letting you know which way are these philanthropic for those who followed our discussion last saturday you should be in position to know these factors. But because one of the functions of the brain is to forget, it will be my responsibility to remind us of those factors. So, I will say core. Uh, and by the way, something that you should copy, something that you should know. In, before you write anything, as far as your essay is concerned, it is important for you to plan for your work. And indeed, it is 
better to plan for a particular question that you're going to attempt, okay? And after planning, kindly don't cross or cancel your plan. That plan is part of the impression, and it can probably redeem you if in any case you are being caught up by time, okay? So don't cancel the plan. So here, our core being the philanthropic factors, philanthropic factors, okay? We'll say, we'll begin with the known, of course, and later I'll bring in what some of you may think are not fit factors to be regarded as philanthropic. We would begin with the known, need to abolish slave trade, to abolish slave trade. Uh -huh. Then we'll talk about need to outcompete need to outcompete Islam. Okay? It was one of the greatest alien religions. That was a force to reckon with and indeed it gave um, the Christian missionaries sleepless nights more so in West Africa and indeed the vast competition between Islam and Christianity partly explains why the jihads in West Africa took place. Okay? And indeed it was the stiff competition also for converts in East Africa. And to be more specific and particular in Buganda, that tantamounted into um, the Wafaransa Wangereza Wars, also known as religious wars. And of course you are aware why they were being regarded as Wafaransa Wangereza Wars, simply because we had the Protestants being supported by the British, who came to be known as the Wangereza, and then the Catholics being supported by the French, who came to be known as the Wafaransa. But of course on board, there were also other religions, such as the Muslims, as well as the traditionalists. So they need to outcompete Islam. Of course, you are aware that Islam was the first alien religion, okay, in Africa, okay, and um, also in West Africa, okay. It, it had a lot of impact in West Africa and, and other parts of Africa, like North Africa, okay. Uh huh. Then we can talk about the need to abolish the barbaric practices. Barbaric practices of the Africans. Barbaric practices of the Africans, such as, of course, um, mud of twins, human sacrifice, and of course, such aspects, cannibalism, such aspects happen more so in societies such as among us, the Igbo among us, the Yoruba, in West Africa, and so on and so forth, then we can talk about the need to promote formal education, promote formal education, and of course this is where now the three arrows were to be very vital, okay? Eh? Reading, writing, and arithmetic, okay? Then we can talk about issues like uh, the need to promote civilization. The need to promote civilization. Okay. The need to promote civilization. Then we can also talk about other aspects such as... Um, um, such as uh, um, they need to settle the surplus population, settle the surplus population. Someone might be wondering, why are we bringing on board the issue of the surplus population yet in the first discussion? We presented the issue of population under economic. True, we presented it under economic factors, but it can also be a social factor. And of course, it depends on your explanation. So here we say that the population had exceeded 
the resources, and of course, which resources are we talking about? We are referring to land, okay? We are referring to land, and of course, the onus was on the respective governments to ensure that they settle the surplus, the surplus population. So the issue of population now becomes a social, a social factor, okay? Then we can also incorporate the issue of prestige. Prestige at times is presented as a political factor, but of course it can also double as uh, a social, as a social, a social factor, okay? Thank you. We'll continue from there.